Good afternoon, and uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have a couple minutes just to uh, get, the, get the group back together and re-energize for our next speaker. Uh, as, uh, as Hunter said, my name is Andy Thulin. I'm the Dean of the College of Agriculture, Food, and Environmental Sciences. Uh, I took that position in as a, as a permanent dean uh, July 1st, so it's been a short time and we've had, we've had a lot of fun in the short time. Uh, I'd like to first thank Hunter Francis uh, from envisioning this event and working uh, to bring together experts from not only from San Luis Obispo but from across the state uh, to participate this, this morning and this afternoon. It's a very important topic and I'm very energized by all the big thinkers in this room and uh, there's some common threads that I think are very powerful for all of us to consider. Uh, this is an especially important time for us to be discussing these topics at Cal Poly because our college is evaluating which areas we grow in and, uh, and where do we need to grow to meet industry uh, demand for talented uh, employees as well as for research. Uh, one area we're focused on is growing our horticulture and uh, uh, crop science department. We're also uh, plant in the planning phase at this time for a new set of facilities for the horticulture and crop science area. Uh, new greenhouses, new processing labs and research labs. So uh, to, to kind of get a, uh, you know, develop the vision and then, and then drive this vision with our facilities to support our students and our faculty for success. Uh, we're also trying to keep up with consumer uh, and production trends, and we've been hiring some new faculty. Um, uh, we're really focused on and trying to stay ahead and, and get caught up with some of the trends that are, that are very quickly coming upon us and the changes, not only in the state of California, but across the country and around the world. This afternoon, you'll hear from more people who have their fingers on the pulse of the growing uh, packaging and consuming of food. Uh, including those speakers today is California's own Secretary of Agriculture, Karen Ross. I've known Karen for several years, and uh, there's nobody more passionate about food systems and agriculture than Karen Ross. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce Kathleen Carley, San Luis Obispo's Division Manner of, of uh, Health Promotion within the Public Health Department. Kathleen is a visionary in identifying health needs and developing programs that address those to benefit the local community. And she's uh, developed one new initiative, Outside and Slow, and uh, we're extremely pleased to have uh, her and her team as a partner for this conference. And uh, uh, she, it was through her that uh, we were able to invite and, uh, and, and get Secretary Ross to the podium this afternoon with her busy schedule. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to believe, but Heal Slow, the County Obesity Prevention Coalition, has been in existence for almost 10 years. Since its inception, our many community partners have been working on things that you would expect an Obesity Prevention Coalition to work on. We've been teaching children and their parents about healthy eating. We've been doing food demonstrations and cooking classes, encouraging fitness, and advocating for active transportation. But Heal Slow has also worked on policy issues and has advocated for changes to the built environment, recognizing that obesity is a complex issue and requires multiple interventions in order to be successful. Our first policy success occurred in 2012 when, Heal, when a Heal Slow work group successfully advocated to the County Board of Supervisors for a bi-local policy, directing staff to purchase local produce whenever possible. The, this diverse work group that worked on this included the Sierra Club, First Five of San Luis Obispo County, the Central Coast Ag Network, the Center for Sustainability, and ultimately the Farm Bureau. Jim Patterson, who was our county supervisor at the time, helped our group develop a model by local policy that was supported by all five of our elected supervisors. In the six months following the adoption of this policy, we worked with all seven local cities, and each of them adopted a resolution in support of by local efforts. Our Healthy Communities Work Group also started around 2012. The focus of this group is the role of the built environment on health. This group has hosted several workshops. We've developed some community health plans for local communities, 
but our primary function has been reviewing new proposals that are coming into the county planning department from a health perspective. We also have a diverse group working on this project, retired professionals, medical experts, the Health Commission, Cal Poly City and Regional Planning Department, STRIDE, County Planning, Center for Sustainability, Slow Council of Governments, Air Pollution Control District, Environmental Health, when we review projects that come into the planning department, we ask questions like, is this housing development connected to the surrounding community so that residents can walk to the market if they want to? Does this business have showers and bike lockers so that employees can ride their bikes to work if they want to? Are there common spaces set aside so that people can get together with their neighbors and develop a sense of community? To date, we have reviewed about 50 projects, and as the economy has improved, we've gotten busier each month. The most recent project that Heal Slow has taken on is Outside In Slow. We take health and climate change personally. This project originated with a phone call about a year ago from the California Department of Public Health. They wanted to know if our public health department would be interested in participating in a pilot project to educate the community on the health impacts of climate change. They did, not have, they did not have a lot of money to give us, but they were hoping with a small amount of seed money to develop some materials, we could integrate climate change messages into the work that we were already doing. In our county, the potential impacts of climate change include increased temperatures, rising sea levels, increased storms and more wildfires, decreased air quality and drought. These environmental conditions can impact our health in numerous ways, from injuries and fatalities to mental health impacts, to heat-related illness, increased rates of asthma and allergies, and vector-borne and waterborne disease. Again, a group of community partners, the usual suspects, got together and we developed a campaign that we've been implementing since August of last year. You may think, well, what's climate change have to do with obesity prevention and heal slow? Um, interestingly, the same behaviors we're advocating for in heal slow, eating fresh, local, organic food, using active transportation, even supporting sustainable green building practices and the projects we're reviewing for, for county planning department. These are the same actions and behaviors that we're advocating for in Outside In Slow. There's a huge overlap. Um, the climate scientists call these things co-benefits. In other words, it's a win-win situation. Yes, riding your bike is good for your heart. It may help your weight, but it's also good for our environment. When we originally spoke with California Department of Public Health, the people at the state said, you know, we may be able to get a speaker for you from the state level to support your efforts on outside and slow. Our group immediately focused on agriculture. We wanted someone to come here and speak about agriculture and climate change. And why? Well, first of all, we have a long history of agriculture in our community. I, I was sharing with somebody at my table earlier, I've lived here for 35 years and I'm a newbie. I mean, the people that have lived in this community have lived here for a couple hundred years and they have long agricultural traditions. We also knew that, no, that Cal Poly has a renowned agricultural college. So we gave our wish list to the state and they came back and said that Karen Ross would be able to speak and that exceeded all of our expectations. Karen Ross was appointed Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture on January 12, 2011 by Governor Edmund G. Brown, Jr. Secretary Ross has deep leadership experience in agricultural issues nationally, internationally, and here in California. Prior to joining the California Department, Secretary Ross was Chief of Staff for U.S. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, a position she accepted in 2009. Before her time at USDA, she served for 13 years as president of the California Association of Wine Grape Growers based in Sacramento. During that same period, she served as the executive director of Wine Grape Growers of America, a coalition of state wine grower organizations, and as executive director of the California Wine Grape Growers Foundation, which sponsors scholarships for the children of vineyard employees. 
Among her many achievements was the creation of a nationally recognized sustainable wine growing program, which assists wine grape growers in maintaining the long-term viability of agricultural lands and encourages them to provide leadership in protecting the environment, conserving natural resources, and enhancing their local communities. I'm extremely honored <laughs> to present Secretary Karen Ross. Well, hello. You all seem so far away. You know, I'd like to sort of have a little microphone and wander about the tables and keep everybody awake, but I'll do my best from here. I don't have a formal presentation, although I have a lot of notes. As my predecessor, the wonderful A.G. Kawamura knows, we've got great people in our public affairs department, small but mighty, I like to say it. And they also know that no matter what they write for me, I rarely use the script. So sorry, folks. I'm going to try to keep you on your toes. So um, first of all, I want to thank you for doing this conference. I think that it is exactly the right thing to do and at exactly the right time. I was just telling my good friend Tim LaSalle that I have never been so excited and so optimistic about the future of agriculture as I am today, despite the drought, which of course I'm going to have to talk about. I am very jealous that I am so old and I'm not going to be a part of the transformations that are happening and will happen and that you all get to be a part of doing. I also think this is exactly the right place, meaning writ large California, but of course here at Cal Poly, learn by doing. One of my favorite new employees is a learn by doing graduate. Uh, there's nothing like it. California is special. We know how beautiful our state is. We know how blessed we have been with natural resources and our spirit of innovation, whether it's in the Silicon Valley or the Central Valley or the Central Coast or Hollywood. We are, as Governor Brown likes to remind us, <clears throat> dreamers and innovators. And that spirit of innovation is what has led to our incredible success. And that spirit of innovation is absolutely what is going to help us face some of the grand challenges of the 21st century. If we can't do it in California, I would be a lot less optimistic about our future. But the fact is, I know we can. And I know we can because part of our infrastructure includes the great University of California and California State University systems. We have produced educators and researchers and CEOs and teachers and entrepreneurs and farmers and ranchers and food systems leaders that do make change happen. And we need to continue to do that. We're also lucky to be at this place at this time because we have remarkable leadership. I know that sounds like an oxymoron in Sacramento. I'm not going to talk about Washington, D.C., if that's okay with you all today. But there is a lot going on, and sometimes it's because we've had crisis. We've gone through economic uncertainties and restoring the state's fiscal stability, which was not an easy thing to do, but it was the grown-up thing to do, and we had people who were willing to work together to make it happen. We are in a drought like California probably has not seen, and we are working together. We know that it's not going to be solved by finger pointing, that there's not one solution, that we have to work together. And guess what one of our best strengths is? It's our diversity, and diversity does create resiliency. How lucky are we to be in California the most populated state in the union, and the number one agricultural state in the union. The state that has over 600 miles of incredible coastline and some of the most magnificent mountain ranges you will ever see. We are a state that is blessed with a Mediterranean climate that absolutely allows us to grow what cannot be easily duplicated. I don't care what they say in the New York Times, in Michigan and Iowa and Missouri and North Carolina. 
They can do some of it, but can they do it practically every day of the year with the quality and the commitment and the leadership on food safety and most efficient use of resources that we do in California? We are a lucky people. And so when we think about the grand challenges before us, I am going to start with the most immediate one, and that would be our drought. And I'm starting with our drought because it is very severe, and it seems probably pretty odd to you that I started out by telling you I've never been so optimistic and excited about agriculture than I am today because of the drought that we're in. But when I look at our record of water, water use efficiency and I look at the tools we have before us, I know that we're going to get through this. I think my boss, Governor Brown, said it best when he kicked off a Western Growers, I'm a Western Growers, Western Governors Association Drought Task Force meeting in December when he said, I think the drought will test our imagination and our science, our technology and our political capacity to collaborate. Diversity, resiliency, collaboration. I'm leading to my own definition of sustainability, if you couldn't see where I was going. Collaboration. Really taking a systems approach and thinking about the whole of what we have and taking an integrated view of what we do. And to do what we've been doing in Sacramento when we created our California Water Action Plan long before we knew we were going to be in drought is really thinking smarter about the use of our resources and an integrated resource management approach, a more holistic way of doing things. And that's what we're trying to do. Agriculture has been doing that despite some of the headlines oftentimes written by people outside of the state of California. I'm very proud of the record of California agriculture. We use less water than we did 40 years ago. We're farming fewer acres than we did 40 years ago. But our economic productivity has increased 96% and our yields have more than doubled. That's a pretty remarkable record. And we can do more. When it comes to water use efficiency, precision irrigation technology is has been deployed on a little over more than 50% of our farmed acreage in the state, which shows the opportunity to improve. And at the state level, we have made an investment to cost share that capital investment for all size farmers to install better irrigation practices. $10 million was made available under the statewide water efficiency and enhancement program a year ago. Another $10 million is made available now, and there's discussion about more because we want to make sure that California agriculture will survive this drought and be even better prepared for the next drought that will come because of climate change. So that is one program that is working to help us improve our practices and still provide the food that the, that the country depends upon us for. Climate change. I am so glad that I get to live in a state where my governor not only says we will talk about it, we are going to spend every waking moment taking the actions that we can because California is in fact a global leader. Our influence is felt far beyond our borders. We have a $2.2 trillion economy which makes us the equivalent of the eighth largest country in the world. And we are paying attention because of the incredible resources that we have to steward them for future generations. We have been a part of creating an adaptation strategy now called Safeguarding California. You know, AG, every administration has to come in and give it everything its own names. Very serious about uh, tackling that. Last year, we were provided funding for one small program that we think can grow. When we think about a state that produces over 50% of the healthy fruits and vegetables and tree nuts for this country, we're also a state that produces 20% of all the milk that's produced in this country. Dairy products are the number one by value product that we have, which means we've got a lot of cows in our state, like almost 2 million of them. 
And so waste management, nutrient management is foundational to making sure that our dairy sector will continue to thrive. And so we now have $12 million to give that right market signal to have more dairy digesters installed in this state, to deploy technology on the dairy farm to not only address a nutrient waste problem and to prevent water quality problems and to mitigate air quality problems and to make significant strides in greenhouse gas reduction because of the deployment of dairy digester technology. I believe that if we can continue to grow this program, we are providing the right signals after three years of waiting for some good decisions from the Public Utilities Commission to really see widespread deployment of dairy digester technology. Again, an opportunity to cost share with the private sector to do environmental good and pr produce public benefits. We um, at the Department of Food and Agriculture, when we think about climate change and our careful stewardship of every input that we have. One of the most important ones are nutrients and fertilizers. Our fertilizer research education program has a 20-year record of investing in research and, and extending those results to improve nutrient management and preventing nitrates in groundwater. We've added a whole new interactive user database so that all 20 years of research is easily available. If you want the 30 second version, the three minute version, or the 300 pages of research that have been done, it's easily found on our website. And we are continuing, continuing to fund projects that will help on climate change as well as preventing any potential water quality problems from our nutrient management. So climate change is something that we are working on every day across cabinet. And one of our newest programs that hopefully, I don't, I, I don't know for sure what's gonna happen next week, but the May revise probably will provide some additional details for a, a healthy soils initiative. And I'm very excited. This is something that's very important to the governor. It's part of our total package for climate change and drought resiliency to really do demonstration projects and provide incentives to improve the carbon and organic matter in our soils, to help with water retention, to really take another step forward of one of the most eco important ecosystems that we have, which is the one right beneath our feet. And it's amazing to me, in some ways we know a lot and in some ways we don't really know enough about what is beneath our feet and the potential to unlock what's in our soils and improve our soil health to make sure that many generations will be able to be as productive as we have been with our soils. So next week we'll have more details of what that will look like and we have a kickoff meeting at our environmental farming panel next Friday. It will be webcast. We will be collecting input from all of our stakeholders to build out a healthy soils initiative that by coincidence or not, Renata is being introduced in the International Year of Soils. So it is a timely topic. It is very much a part of, of ensuring the future sustainability of California agriculture and improving our resiliency at the local and regional level for drought and climate change. But let me suggest the most important grand challenge of our time. And I am going to refer to a report that was released about three weeks ago by the Chicago Global Affairs Council. This one gets to me because it matters so much to me. They state that nutrition is essential to global food security. And I quote, malnutrition from undernourishment to obesity is a global challenge affecting every country on earth and placing more than a quarter of the world's people at serious health risk. More than 800 million people suffer from chronic hunger. 1.9 billion people are overweight, including 600 million people who are obese. When you think about the cost to society, not only in healthcare costs because of chronic disease, but in lost economic opportunities because of lost productivity. 
this is the challenge. We have been very good at producing calories just to help people survive. We need to make an equal investment in nutrition to help every person thrive and achieve their potential and their full productivity on this earth. I would suggest this would be one of the most rewarding pathways for any young person to pursue in the 21st century. Because the grand challenge of this is that we're going to have to produce that nutrition with less arable land, less available water, and impacted water quality on a global basis. Think of what it can mean as a student to become engaged in a food and agricultural system to address grand challenges like climate change, more and more weird weather patterns, and especially for us, drought, and every once in a while an atmospheric river where flood will be the challenge of the time. Get ready for some Q&A that way. <clears throat> okay, I, I could just walk around, sure. get rid of my nervous energy. So we will need creativity, and we will need innovation, and we will need critical thinking that will come from the next generation. And I have no doubt that because of the DNA of the people of this place, this special place called California, with great institutions like Cal Poly, working in communities that love to and embrace collaboration because we value diversity and having all viewpoints and all expertise at the table, that this is a challenge. Hunger is a solvable problem. Obesity is a solvable problem. But it's not just one thing. It's the whole menu that Kathleen talked about. So as you think about the programs that you're investing in for our future, I think you're on the right track. I know because of the great people that were on the program this morning, and I'm somewhat intimidated to follow people like Ann Thrupp and Paul Dolan, who are true leaders in sustainability and help make a difference in the wine grape community a decade ago, that you've had lots of definitions of sustainability but I will share with you mine, and that is that each one of us lives our lives and takes actions on a daily basis for people we may never see and a time that we may never live in. If we were to think about getting away from what's in it for me now and worked across diverse viewpoints to collaborate on solutions and made those kinds of investments because that is for the, the future, for that generation we'll never get to touch. We know that is what made this country and this state such a special place. Those people who were willing to make investments in our infrastructure, those people who had a master plan for education in the state, those people who put in a water system that allowed us to take grounds and produce what few other places in the world can do. What they did for us, it's time for us to pay forward. And that, to me, is a true definition of sustainability. I could talk forever to you, but I've never learned anything by being the talker. What I want to do, and what I hope you're prepared to do, is have a very robust dialogue, and lots of questions, and lots of challenges to me, and including the wish list of what you should be doing when you go back to Sacramento, Karen Ross. And with that, I want to open it up. Do we have microphones that we work? We have a microphone over here. So this is a great opportunity for all of us. Don't be shy. So, yeah, come on up. If, if you don't mind coming up to the microphone, that would be great. Um, while I'm waiting, I should mention that all of the talks this morning have been recorded. And with the speaker's permission, we will be linking those uh, as YouTube videos on our website along with the speaker presentation. And while you're walking up, sir, one program that I, I, I meant to mention and I forgot to do, and this came out of the governor's executive order last month, is a new innovation and technology fund at the California Energy Commission. We know that Californians have a remarkable record of energy conservation and that part of 
of surviving drought is for us as Californians to develop a culture of conservation and innovation with regard to recycled water use. And so based on their track record of helping to set standards that have driven energy efficiency around this country, we are going to do the same on water application technologies to try to fast track new technologies for water reuse and treating brackish water. And so that is a fund that we will know more about over the next month. But I think it's an exciting signal. And when I think about all this engineering things around this campus, and I'm, and I'm gonna go see the Irrigation Resource Center, this is one to keep our eyes on. That's the one thing government can do. You know, regulations tend to be laggards and stimulating change, what stimulates change faster are marketplaces, but government through our policies and incentives can in fact stimulate innovation and the broad application and commercialization of technologies. So I'm very excited about that particular fund and I didn't want to forget to share it with you. Sir. Uh, Andrew Langford, Guy University. Uh, my familiarity is with almonds, particularly in California. Uh, and I noticed that the Almond Board of California is still pushing for increasing of exports of almonds out of the state. And I, my question is, do you imagine that there's some sort of limit on this growth at some point in relation to the resource of water? Well, how perfect. I was just talking about my belief in markets, and that's my response to you. Markets, California... Farmers and ranchers grow for markets. They're not growing because this is what I feel like growing. Our land and our water is too expensive. And so we are growing for consumer demand. And the fact is, what we grow in California, like almonds, are not grown in many other places around the world, nor can they be. So California is, is the home of 80% of the world's almond supply. It is a healthy, nutritious, I mean, it is a nutrient-dense snack food as well as an ingredient in foods. And so I believe that what we will see over time as our groundwater basins come into balance, as we do a more integrated approach of managing our surface water with our groundwater, as some of our land use regulations kick in, those will be the types of things that will frame how farmers will make their decisions, but farmers in California will always grow for consumer demand and markets. So um, the other thing I do want to add on that is that it shocks people because we grow so much and we ship 50% of the fruits and vegetables to the rest of the country. Well, guess what? We're deficit on, on other proteins, so we actually import 26% of our, ho our total food needs in California. We, we export a lot less than we import of all of the goods and services that we as consumers demand. So this is a consumer-farmer relationship, and as long as consumer demand continues to grow, people are going to make decisions about the highest and best use of their water and their land to meet that consumer demand. How's that for a long way of dodging the question? Hi there. Um, I particularly liked your definition of sustainability because it um, speaks to the clientele I work with, which is children and teachers. And like you were just saying about the, our exporting of our farm goods, we need them to be in our own schools, the farm to school movement. I I I'm here today to, to speak on behalf of those type of movements to ask your support for the farm to school movement and the children's garden movement and the health and nutrition of our children. And we're combining all those together, as well as with the green school movement, calling it uh, Living Schoolyards. This is Living Schoolyards uh, Month. It's a piece of um, a resolution, actually. Um, AB, uh, ACR, ACR 198 um, from Ping in uh, San Francisco. But we do hope to make it as a piece of legislation uh, around Living Schoolyards so that we can teach our kids about these at an early age, so I want to give you information about that. That'd be, that'd be great. Um, we do have a farm to fork office that is focused um, in these early years of the creation of that office by legislation by then Speaker Perez two years ago. It's focused almost exclusively on schools right now because one of the most important connector points that we could see our our purpose is to help connect school nutrition directors with local regional farmers. And the whole issue of procurement is a huge one. We just had four staff members at the farm to school conference that was held at Asilomar. Somebody had to go and it wasn't me, I'm just saying. <laughs> 
So we're big supporters of that. Um, three weeks ago, I got to speak at the launch of Edible Thursdays, which is all about California products being served in our schools. That was funded by one of our many specialty crop block grants that go to a lot of programs like this because it is such a great investment and a smart investment for us to be making. So I think you'll find us to be enthusiastic friends and supporters of programs like that. Oh, not fair. You talk to me all the time. Sorry, nah, but I'm going to feed kidding. you. I'm gonna, I want you to share with what you just shared with me in, 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 over lunch because it was so inspiring. Um, but first, I want to thank you so much. Your, um, your energy and your optimism and your, and your um, zest is, is really fun you know, to, to hear and see. And we're so lucky to have you at this thank moment you. in time. Um, I'm the lucky one. <laughs> Um, but a couple things that I, I've, I've been really excited by that I've heard from you and from others as well, I'd love to have you share. One is uh, the St Strategic Growth Council, the interagency yes. cooperation mm -hmm. and the breaking down of the silos. It's yep. really exciting. And, um, and then if you could talk about the Sustainable Ag Lands program and, and that vision you uh, painted my, about my the vision. Urban okay. Edge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm missing a land use meeting today. So um, a year and a half ago, um, the Department of Food and Agriculture was added to the Strategic Growth Council. It was ironic that it wasn't included in the original creation of the Strategic Growth Council, and we're thrilled to be there, and especially because I have such good friends across Cabinet who are as passionate about preserving working landscapes as I am, so Secretary Laird from the Resources Agency, Matt Rodriguez from EPA, and, and others. And so we fought really hard for that first spending plan under the cap and trade auction funds to make sure that when that came to the Strategic Growth Council, that a piece of that could go to farmland conservation, and the third phase of that program will be incentives to cost share with farmers practices that will improve the resiliency of our farmlands that we're working so hard to preserve and especially where there are urban pressures on them. It's all part of sustainable communities and the work that we want to do which goes right back to climate resiliency. My personal vision that, that I believe there's huge opportunities for us to really think about hardening the urban edge of our cities. And by that, I mean doing what a county like Yolo County has done, where they've worked very hard when they say, this is ag land to be protected, we're going to protect it, and we're not going to let on any given Tuesday a land use decision to be made to leapfrog and really start a sprawl issue from going on. I believe when we want to think about co-benefits, which I'm a huge believer in, that if we would think about creating a buffer around our urban edges, and that buffer could be land available for new beginning farmers, many who may never have the resources to do a large-scale agriculture, but could do small-scale agriculture close to an urban center, close to the restaurants and chefs. AG is going to be talking a lot about that, I'm sure, tomorrow. But the exciting opportunities for urban ag and farming on the urban edge. It is a challenging place to be farming, but I think we can be creating opportunities for new and beginning farmers with a really viable business model and hardening that, that urban edge so that we can have mass production of food at affordable price points for those many people who can't afford much in life as well as having that, that that fringe around our urban edge and tying it in with our urban farming as well. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that over time we will get to more and more successful models of that. I, I think it's a fun idea to think about. Okay, there's got to be more questions, and there are. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I think that you're very inspiring. And uh, my name is Leora Adler. I'm also Guy University. And uh, I have another question about almonds. Well, I didn't get introduced as the Secretary of Almonds. That slipped out before. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, this county, especially in the Paso Robles area, mm -hmm. used to be the largest in the 1920s and 30s, largest producer of almonds by mostly dry uh, farming dry techniques. Farming. Mm -hmm. And since the introduction of irrigation in Central Valley, uh, they have not been able to compete. Uh, on the other hand, there are new technologies like biochar mm -hmm. uh, to improve soils, uh, like 
compost tea fracking, uh, water boxes to collect dew, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that we've been researching. Uh, in order to see how we could restore, I would use the word regenerate, uh, rather than even sustainability, the dry almond farming potentials, both in Yolo County, Cape Valley, and in the Paso Robles area. So I wonder what kind of thinking your department has or what kind of support your department has for the reintroduction of dry almond farming, which could have effects on also walnut farming and other uh, fruit and nut tree farming. So the California Department of Food and Agriculture um, is with 400 crops in the state. We don't have many programs that are crop specific. But the things that you just mentioned, especially biochar, composting, this is going to be part of the Healthy Soils Initiative. Certainly, um, the wine grape sector uh, has probably done as much in recent times um, on dry farming and doing some experimentation with dry farming than, than many of the other commodities that I'm familiar with. But again, um, Governor Brown feels strongly about this, as do I. We don't see the state as being the person that should get in the business of telling farmers what to farm, but we do, with our policies, create the frameworks that create the environment for decisions to be made by entrepreneurs based on what markets are, what their land availability is and their soils are, what their water is and what those costs of those are to pursue plantings for markets that fit the region where they are. So my boss has been quoted extensively and much of the public media that he does not think it's a very good idea for state government or any type of government to say, this is what you shall grow. We want to preserve that decision making to the farmers but, but the issues of land availability, water availability, will drive those decisions more than any government regulation. The dry land farming methodologies and work that's being done on that through universities is the appropriate place for that kind of data to be developed and for cooperative extension to make sure that it's getting to our farmers and has been a huge part of the success of innovation and farming in the state. The ability to translate findings in a research lab to end, user, end users has really stimulated the most innovation in farming that, that I know of in any place. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I'd like to also echo um, uh, yeah, our appreciation for your ambassadorship and how exciting it is to see how the state is getting behind innovative uh, agriculture. Um, but uh, in the case of this county, we have, we have um, Title 19 and Title 21 of our land use codes. And if you want to do something that doesn't involve flat row crops and tractors, at, at a certain point to start it, you've got to walk up to the planning counter. And there's nothing in Title 19 or 21 about the fact that the state's excited about some of these things or that the state supports some of these things. Really, I know that there are many of us who feel like there's no backup there that there's a disconnect there. Oh, land use planning. <laughs> um, it, is, it is a local function that um, probably the closest we have come, and it's being done more with incentives, is through the Strategic Growth Council. You know, there was a time you couldn't even say regional land use planning. I mean, regionalism was just like really, really, really bad. So I do, as I see more local governments doing their climate adaptation strategies, which every, almost every county has done. Some of these issues are being driven by that. Um, it is very hard to start to tamper with local land use autonomy whenever a bill is introduced in the legislature. It runs into buzz saws. So perhaps there's an opportunity at this time because of water issues and climate issues to build an unusual coalition, but it, is, it has a track record of beating up a lot of people who have tried to do just small changes in land use planning and that autonomy that the local governments hold. So I don't have a good answer for you, but I, but I do, we have seen it with climate that it's created an atmosphere for people to really pay more attention at the local level. We're seeing that now on conservation. You know, the reason we have mandatory 
urban conservation measures for the first time ever is because we tried the voluntary route last year and didn't get very good participation, so then that led to a mandate this year. So it's hard to say going forward that things that we thought were sacrosanct won't be touched, but that right now I can't see it, even in this legislature, of, of, of getting a lot of traction. But I'm always open to talking to you about it and seeing where there might be some opportunities. I want some easy questions that there's good answers to. <laughs> I don't know if this will be an easy answer <laughs> or question. Um, I want to thank you for all the work that you do. Um, so this is more with labeling of food. And there's a huge debate over this. I know a lot of farmers don't want it. And a lot of farmers do want it. But what are your, um, what's your take on labeling GMOs? Um, on food like Vermont did? So um, my friend Chuck Ross is in the middle of all that. My cousin, I'll call him my cousin Chuck Ross. He's the Secretary for Agriculture in Vermont. So obviously we've had a couple statewide battles about this. There have been a number of county battles about this. I'm not speaking for the Brown administration when I state my personal position. I think consumers feel disconnected from farmers, and that's the worst gap to have in the food system. You know, we should be closely linked. And I think what consumers want in their food system is transparency. And so I, I am very open to labeling or making sure the information is easily available to all consumers, however it might be. I know there are issues from a food packaging point of view of everything else by law that's required to be there. But in this day and age, practically all consumers would have access to use a scanner to be able to see everything that they want. So that kind of transparency, I actually think, is an important piece of the food system that we should not be afraid of. Do you think that the grocery store should then provide a computer or something that could pull up all yeah, the information? When you look at having, Macy's, they don't yeah. have hardly anybody at desks anymore because they've got all these scanner things and you're supposed to just take it up and know how to use it. Target has it, even in the toy division. So it seems to me that we haven't really thought openly enough about technology today, 21st century. Um, but I will also say, that we have not had, I think, the most intelligent conversation in depth about how do we use less water, how do we use less pesticides, how do we embrace technology to continue our adaptation of the best strategies to even have a well-informed population about GMOs, what is the technology, how has it changed, how is the fact that we can now map the, the genome and know what traits we want to be breeding for or to breed out of things for, for achieving our best potential. So I would start with we need more education and a well-informed, not 30-second soundbite conversation about GMOs, and we want transparency in the food system and make it easily available for all citizens to see where that product came from, how it was produced, and who grew it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for being here, and I'm really enjoying I'm this whole here. event. <laughs> now, I have a rather off-the-wall question, and we talk about obesity as being part of what you're looking at, mm -hmm. uh, and you talk about collaboration. What are you looking at with the Affordable Care Act, which has now combined behavioral health mm -hmm. with primary care, mm -hmm. because we're looking at the holistic right. wellness pattern And prevention, here. yeah. And uh, Dr. Vincent Folletti's adverse childhood effects study from Kaiser Permanente in San Diego County was a leader in that change of bringing behavioral health and health care together. So when we're looking at obesity, one of the primary um, pieces that he found out is it has to do with childhood trauma. And so mm -hmm. it's not as simple as saying, right. well, you need to eat this and not that. Right. And so I'm, I'm hoping in the messaging we're looking at that holistic wellness approach. And are you familiar with that and what are you doing with it? I, I, I'm not of my good friend Diana Dooley, the Secretary of Health and Human Services were here. She would be able to go through this extensively. But because uh, um, of this shift to prevention. It's not just about heads and beds and hospitals anymore. It's about preventing chronic diseases, that that is the most effective way of ensuring the better quality of life and healthcare savings. That prevention is going to be embedded. And I think actually nutrition education is going to be cool again. 
okay, I'm really old, but when I was growing up, there were like home ec classes and nutrition education. And in fact, Cooperative Extension still has some of the best nutrition educators in the system, and they still do that through 4-H and youth programs. But we need to make that a part of our entire food and agricultural literacy that also has nutrition education as part of that. And you're right, it is, it, it, once again, it's not a single solution. Let's point a finger at that and think we've cured the problem. One of the things, and, and it's a little bit of a sensitive topic, but two years ago, um, Governor Brown asked the secretary to chair a Let's Get Healthy California task force. That's a pretty comprehensive approach at how do we improve the health of all of our citizens. So it's everything from food access to nutrition education and quality of life issues that will ensure that we have healthier people and lower health care costs. So there are many attempts at doing that. It's a big system. Um, it, it doesn't turn around easily. But I'm, I'm very excited that we are finally shifting to prevention and that the fact nutrition education is fundamental to that, that we can make really important strides. Great. And I hope we can put a, a bigger push on 4-H, which is one of the best prevention programs we I have. I pledge my head to clear, thanking <laughs> my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, and my country. <laughs> I'm a blue jacket envy kid because my school is too small to have FFA, so 4-H is it. <laughs> That's it. Oh. <laughs> uh, this, this ties in somewhat with what she was addressing, uh -huh. and um, I'm really glad you brought up the statistics of worldwide malnutrition and obesity. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, how can you fight these issues when there's such a huge food and agricultural corporations with billions upon billions of dollars that are the creators of the foods that are less than healthy and contribute to the ongoing and increasing health problems of malnutrition and obesity. So um, I, I, I'm a big believer in personal responsibility and consumers drive markets. Um, I do think that the gap that has occurred between farmers and consumers over the last four decades in particular, as fewer and fewer people wanted to stay on the farm because it's a hard way to make a living, it's very risky, um, and you don't make a lot of money, that many people left farming and we consolidated and become very, very, very efficient. And so we've taken food for granted. We haven't given it a lot of thought. It has evolved around things like get it, get it fast, get it easily packaged and convenient. We've demanded that as consumers because we wanted to live a lifestyle that wasn't about having to go out and find food and prepare it and all those things that go with it. One of the best things that's happening right now is the attention that's being paid on our food and where it comes from and who's producing it. It gives us that opportunity to more closely connect with our consumers, to have a better informed consumer, which means we'll have better informed voters and a better system if we're working in it together. But I think it's much too simplistic to say, the corporations made this food and made me eat it. I think that's simplistic and not fair. No, I'm not saying that they make you eat it, of course, but in order for it to have that effect. Yes. So if you look at just a, one example, I have to use it, McDonald's, poor McDonald's. They're in a world of hurt right now because people are, are calling that out as an example. There are, this morning when I was driving down in my hometown, there are Cocos and Chili's and Caro restaurants that are closing because they haven't changed with the time of what people are looking for, which is more about nutrition. It is about fresh. It is about more fruits and vegetables and tree nuts. It's about lean proteins. It's about less sugar and salt. I will also say the school nutrition program, which is in a battle right now and should never be, is being politicized. The way to fast drive change in food, processed food formulations, and I've seen this firsthand, is through the school lunch programs. When those guidelines change, 
people change their formulations for schools. And when it's accepted in schools, it helps lead to change on the grocery shelf. And a lot of companies have made significant changes because consumers are driving the change. So there's a lot of change going on. Yes, because I'm actually thinking more along the lines of what's on the, the grocery shelves. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh huh. Secretary Ross, again, thank you for being uh -huh. here. Um, agricultural labor is a crisis in California, and it has been for a number of years. Crops are being left in the field, left unharvested. Um, and I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on potential solutions to that problem and what can be done about it. Remember at the beginning I said I'm going to point to Sacramento, not Washington, D.C., as something that works? Um, unfortunately, the politics of this one are causing a lot of harm. Um, we, we need, and this country deserves, and the people who have, have been forced to live in shadows deserve immigration reform. And with immigration reform for agriculture, we also need some sort of, of a fair and equitable uh, guest worker program so that people can move back and forth to the, where the jobs are. Um, so until we get a change in politics in Washington, I am not optimistic. And I've worked on immigration reform for 15, 16 years. And a few times I've actually been foolish enough to say, I think this is the year it's going to happen. And in fact, I said that in 2009 when I started with the secretary. I said, I really feel, as my first White House meeting, like, I really feel that immigration reform is going to happen next year. The secretary looked at a couple of longtime staffers and they kind of went. So it is a serious problem. Governor Brown signed a memorandum of understanding with the Minister of Agriculture in Mexico last year. We wanted to see if there was something we could do as neighbors to make some improvements to make the H-2A, which is a temporary worker program, work better. But it is a federal program, and there's very minimal changes that we can, can do. But we're trying to figure out what we can do other than just publicly state over and over again how important this issue is for California and especially for our agricultural sector. I know my friend Miles Ryder, who's the CEO of Driscoll, said last year, if it hadn't been for the drought, the shortage of farm labor last year would have been the headline news. And it's especially hard for a state where we have so many hand-grown, hand-nurtured, hand-harvested crops for us to work through this other than investments and mechanization. I'm coming back to the engineering guys. Mechanization will, will free up people for better paying jobs maybe not as tedious jobs, but we're always going to need hand labor because of the kinds of crops that require that kind of care. So basically, um, we need to approach uh, our federal Congress. representatives. Anybody Con running for Congress. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, and good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. For, um, I was really intrigued by your idea about the urban fringe. Uh, and we've been in city and regional planning mm -hmm. very concerned because it has implications for the city itself, mm -hmm. too. And we espouse density and so on. Yeah. Um, but it's quintessentially a land use issue, and you just uh, ceded that uh, initiative to the local mm -hmm. governance. Um, does, the, does the department have some strategies or incentives that might allow this uh, basically green belt formation yeah. that you talked about that would help small yeah. farmers. Ren Renata and I have talked because I'm very hopeful that over time as people get more comfortable with the, w the spending plans for the cap and trade proceeds from the auctions going through Strategic Growth Council, that that is a, as, as a central point for creating those types of incentives. You know, having big pots of money for programs that fulfill the kind of criteria that we have for sustainable communities, and now the strategic ag land conservation program can be ways that we can incentivize um, actions in that regard. The other thing, and this is very important for students, is that active citizen participation in our government processes, and the ones at the local level, because they happen frequently, they can sometimes be contentious because you hate it when you see neighbors being pitted against neighbors. But 
developing collaborations at the local level and participating when the local planning commission is doing their meetings and the votes coming up either at the board of supervisors or the city council those are critically important to our sustainability they have long range impacts on our ability to continue to contribute to society so that's an important part of sustainability too is to be really engaged citizens and voters well, uh, as a member of the city's planning commission, um, we found strategic incentive structures that we can tap into at the state level yeah. are very persuasive. And um, the city has been very committed to a green belt. That's but great. But we do see that as a strategy across the state for small family farming, too. Yeah. I, ho I hope so. I think it would be great at a time where we know we need to re-energize agriculture with new farmers, which can be young farmers, it can be our returning veterans, it can be older people who have always had this yearning to reconnect with the land and have started small-scale farms as a second or third career. I can hardly wait for my fourth or fifth one. Who knows what it's going to be? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Am I done? You're done. You did a great job. And I, I want to thank we owe everybody you an for being here. Round of applause. <laughs>